Well, we have a real treat this morning. John Ortberg is with us. John is the senior pastor at Menlo Church in San Francisco Bay Area. His best-selling books include I'd Like You More If You Were More Like Me, All the Places to Go, Soul Keeping, Who Is This Man, and God is Closer Than You Think. John teaches around the world at conferences and churches. He writes articles for Christianity Today and Leadership Journal, and he's a senior fellow of the Martin Institute and also Fuller Seminary. He's been known to preach sermons on the Lego movie and the gospel according to Les Miserables. John and his wife Nancy have three adult children, two of whom are Westmont alums. He went to Wheaton with and is close friends with our very own Mark Nelson. And he also now has a new grandson named Chance. Is that right? That's good. That's good. Uh, Jamie and I had the privilege of taking a postdoctoral course with he and Nancy. I think it was on leadership. And we just found them to be so refreshing and authentic and helpful and wise. Uh, we learned a lot from them. This summer, uh, while on a private retreat uh, in a hammock, I read his book, Soul Keeping. Uh, I considered it a personal intervention, and uh, it was fantastic. I, I recommend it to you. Great nourishment for my tired self. Uh, he's a frequent speaker here at Westmont's chapel. He likes us. So let's give a warm Westmont welcome to our brother, John Orberg. It is such a gift and an honor to be with you. Uh, and I think I'll start with a question. Does anybody here ever worry about anything? Um, I can remember when I was a kid worrying a lot about school, worried about taking tests, worried about what I would get on my report card and whether I would get in trouble and what if my parents found out. And I remember thinking what a great thing it would be to become an adult because when you're an adult you don't really have to worry anymore. As I got a little older, I worried about losing a tennis. I worried about where I would go to college. I worried about whether or not I would make friends. I worried about what I would do for a living and would I be able to live up to my potential, whatever that might be. I worried about if I would ever meet a girl who would want to marry me. And, and then one did, uh, maybe only for a few moments of bad judgment, but that was enough to get my foot in the door. And then I worried if we would ever have a child. And then we did. And I remember holding her and have the oddest experience that I hadn't anticipated. Uh, this tiny little lump of tissue. And, and um, I had uh, for a moment this glimpse of her entire life, whatever that might be. And I said to Nancy, I can't believe this little baby that I'm holding right now will grow up one day. And I didn't know it then, but she would go to Westmont College and uh, maybe get married, and, and then she'll grow old, and this little red hair that she has right now will turn gray, and then silver, and then we'll grow old and die, and then she'll grow old and die, this little baby I'm holding right now. And Nancy said, let me hold her, because you're creeping her out. <laughs> uh, worry is not my friend. Worry always tries me to to get to live in a future that I cannot control and miss this present moment right here where I could know the wonder of being alive and gratitude. Worry is insatiable. I can worry about not having kids and then worry about having kids and having them turned out badly. These are mutually incompatible outcomes, but I can worry about them both. I have a finite capacity to live, but an infinite capacity to worry. Worry is relentlessly joy-killing. There won't be enough. You're not going to make it. They won't like it. The bubble's going to burst. You will disappoint people. Worry will get me to say, but what if, rather than, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Worry will say, if only, rather than, in all things give thanks. Worry is sneaky. It 
approaches me all the time, often unawares. A couple days ago, looking forward to this moment, I got an email from my good college friend, Mark Nelson. And he wrote, among other things, John, I would love to connect before, during, or after your talk. I'm not making this up. Yes, I said during, and I meant it. If it looks like it's going to be boring, we could just take a break in the middle and go out for coffee. <laughs> so now I have to worry about giving a boring talk. And I'd like to ask you to help with uh, that. If it turns out that this talk is boring, if some of you in this section could just raise your hand. And then I will go have coffee with Mark Nelson, and you can enjoy four days earlier. Jesus, no, that's, you don't have to get excited about that, because it's not going to happen. It's just, speakers say stuff sometimes, it doesn't mean anything. That's one of those things. <laughs> Jesus hates worry. He hates what it does to people. He hates how it makes us small, and selfish, and timid, and mean, and chokes joy, and kills dreams, and steals our moments our days hour by hour. Jesus hates worry, but he loves worriers. He has great compassion on people who worry. And it may be that anxiety or chronic worry or panic attacks are a crushing foe for you. And maybe sometimes uh, other people or even talks like a chapel talk or reading the Bible can make you feel uh, worse because they imply that anxiety is your fault or a lack of faith. Our oldest daughter who went here to Westmont uh, has dealt with chronic, often severe anxiety since she was six years old. I'll never forget dropping her off on this campus for that first day and leaving her sitting on a little bench and knowing how overwhelmed her internal world was. And Westmont ended up being a wonderful place for her, but not that first day, not that first semester. And one of my great regrets as a parent was how many years it took me to recognize the enemy that anxiety was and is in her life. She does not lack faith. She is a hero to me. She, and I know some of you, have to fight an inner battle that nobody outside of her body will ever understand. But God knows. And God cares. Furthermore, we live in this world where terrible things happen. And we see this week by week, uh, an earthquake in Indonesia, uh, our own country torn apart right now in, politically in ways that seem insoluble. And Jesus is never glib about this. Jesus was very acquainted with deep suffering from the slaughter of innocent children in Bethlehem when he was born to the execution of his cousin John early in his ministry to his own crucifixion. And still, in this world, with that evil, come words from his most famous talk, the Sermon on the Mount, that lie right at the heart of his message and of the good news. This is what he wrote. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what should we eat or what should we drink? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Rather, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has trouble enough of its own. And I know for people who struggle with anxiety, a passage like this can sometimes make you feel worse because now you worry about how much you worry. Uh, one Old Testament scholar notes that the command, fear not, is the most common command in the Bible. 
Uh, but it's different from don't lie or don't steal or don't gossip. Those are things that we would be able to stop. This is not so much a command of obligation as a, a wonderful invitation. It's an opportunity based on coming to see how things are if I believe in the Father that Jesus talked about. Look at the birds, he says. When our family lived in the Midwest, one spring day we were driving and a family of Canada geese was on one side of the road, two adults and nine little fuzzy yellow goslings. And Nancy had to stop and said to our then small children, kids, look at how the babies and the daddy are eating while the mommy watches over them. And I said to her, how do you know that it's the mommy watching over those little geese? Maybe it's the daddy watching over the little geese. You don't know geese that well. And my wife said, no, it's always the same in every species. The mommy gives up her own well-being to sacrifice for the family while the daddy just stuffs his face. It's always the same. <laughs> And then the adult geese switched off, and the one that had been watching started to eat, and the one that had been eating started to watch. And I was so grateful to God. <laughs> and, then, and then both adults started eating, and nobody was watching the kids, and that kind of shot the whole analogy. But, but here's Jesus' point. Uh, God is continually at work in, watching over, at play with his creation, and taking care of it. And that's why we delight in it. We do not live in a machine. Every time a hummingbird sweeps in for nectar, every time a daisy pops up out of the ground, every time a dolphin leaps at Butterfly Beach, that's God. And then Jesus goes on, not just to this world, but to people now. He says once, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Take a real good look at the person next to you for a moment right now. Just take a good look at them. If you were to calculate their worth in sparrows, how many sparrows would it take? <laughs> was actually intended as a rhetorical question, actually. Uh, one of the fascinating aspects, okay, you can continue that one on after we're done with chapel. One of the fascinating aspects of worry is uh, what I worry over reveals to me what it is that I really care about. What I worry over reveals to me what my heart is wrapped up in. I live in the Bay Area uh, in a town called Menlo Park and a lot of people are real into their cars there. And I was parking. We have real congested parking downtown. And I was backing my car out. And I heard this tiny little scraping sound. Metal scraping on metal. And so I got out of my car to take a look. It wasn't a dent. It wasn't even a ding. It was just a little scratch on the other car. It's almost decorative. But I drive a 10-year-old Honda, it's kind of a beater, and the other car was not. It was a brand new car. It was a brand new Italian car. Its name rhymes with Terrari. <laughs> and I'm a pastor in that town, so I felt obligated, and I left a note with my real phone number on it. And the next day, the guy called me up and said, I appreciate your leaving this note for me. I just have to have you understand this car is like my baby and I need it to be in mint condition. And I said, okay, I understand. And he said, so I got to take it in to see what it's going to cost to get it repaired so that it looks like new. And he called back the next day and he said, I took it in and the bad news is they can't buff out that scratch. The whole panel has to be replaced. I said, okay, I understand. It's okay. He called me back the next day. He said, bad news is they don't have the panel here. They actually have to send to Italy to have it brought over. I said, okay, I understand. Call me back one more time. It's a true story. He said, uh, this whole thing has bothered me so much. I'm getting a brand new car. I'm not even going to use the old one anymore. And so you don't owe me a thing. And I said, and I said, well, if you're not going to use the old car anymore. <laughs> uh, what it is that I worry about tells me what it is that my heart is wrapped up in. And that's part of what Jesus teaches about. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because you'll worry about them, but they're all going to, you know, end up in the same place. 
an amazing quality of God is that he cares about you, but God is never worried. Hope, a wise person once said, is the joyous anticipation of the good. Hope is the joyous anticipation of good. And God knows that good is coming. And so God is never worried. God is very hopeful. And one of the reasons why it is a good thing for human beings to care more about God than anything else is you never have to worry about God. There are, in the Bible, a staggering number of promises that all make this same claim. That it's possible to live in the presence of this kind of God a life that is not consumed by worry. Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust God. Trust also in me. God is our refuge and strength. My God will supply your every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you. In the words of a psalm that we'll be reminded of at the close of our time today, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, the present nor the future, nor anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now these are not promises that terrible things won't happen. Terrible things have happened this week and will happen next week. Paul himself was beaten, whipped, chained, tortured, executed. And that's the Paul who said he was convinced that none of those horrible sufferings could separate him from the love of God. In other words, ultimately, eternally, all will be well. And either that is so or it is not so. Either despair will win or hope will win. And you will live your life, and you have such remarkable lives stretching out before you for so many, many years. You will live your life in light of one of those two paths. And Jesus said, hope wins. Jesus said, things are not just better than you think, they are infinitely better than you think. Jesus said, things will not just turn out well, they will turn out indescribably, inconceivably well. Pain, suffering, injustice, and death will not just be redeemed, they will be gloriously, creatively redeemed without exception. And if you're ready to give life beyond worry a try, he has an invitation. It is not, don't worry. You can't not worry by trying really hard to not worry. Now I want to say this, worry is not a sin. People may choose to disobey God with greed or lust or pride or deceit. Nobody says, God, I'm going to defy you so I can fill my days with chronic anxiety, panic, and despair. Nobody says that. So if you wrestle with worry, don't add guilt to it. What Jesus does give is an invitation. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Live under his care. Scott mentioned uh, we have now our first grandchild. He was born just four months ago. And he lives in the reality that somebody is caring for him. And he lives a worry-free life. He cries, he gets mad and frustrated sometimes. But he never worries about tomorrow. Would you like to see about 40 seconds worth of my grandson chance and what a worry-free life looks like? We have a video, so if we can show it. This is chance. And... Take a look.
there's this wonderful statement that God makes in the Bible where he asks the question, can a mother forget her child? And then he says, she may forget, but I will not forget. And what we see in the birth of every child, just like what we see in the rising of the sun every morning, is the will of God that this world should go on, is the promise of God that he will feed little birds and, and clothe the grass of the field, and, and he will care for you. And the invitation from Jesus is to live in this God-bathed, God-soaked, God-powered, God-watched-over world with my life, with all of my concerns and all the bad stuff that will happen to me. And that's why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Make it your top priority above all else to get in on what God is doing and to have his goodness shape your character. Study God, love God, follow God, serve God, think about God, be preoccupied with God, be surrendered to God, give the way that God gives. Find him in particular in this moment. There's a wonderful book written several centuries ago by Jean-Pierre de Cassad called The Sacrament of the Present Moment. And the idea is the only place that you can find God is not tomorrow and not yesterday, in this moment right now, in every person's face, in every person's words, in, in the books that you read. Watch him at work with the birds and the flowers. Rearrange your strategy for living around this remarkable opportunity where I come from in the Bay area. There was a guy named Meyer Friedman, and he said, the thing that kills people most, what contributes most to anxiety, worry, stress, burdens in our day, is an epidemic that he calls hurry sickness. He says, we are in such a rush to get through life, and it's killing us. He was actually a cardiac doctor. He says, the number one contributor to heart problems that people are having, we just can't not hurry. So I want to do a mass confession of hurry in chapel for a moment. If you suffer from hurry sickness, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. And not yet. Hang on. Let me just, this is just what I'm talking about right here. Just give me a minute. Uh, if you want to know how to diagnose this, if you suffer from hurry sickness, uh, when you go to the D.C., you will find yourself counting how many people are in each line to make sure that you get in the shortest line possible so that you can get your food quicker than you would if you got into the other line. And if you really suffer from hurry sickness, if you're really sick, not only will you do that, but like if you get in line A, you will keep track of the person who would have been you in line B. Because if they get through the line and you're still in lines, like God forbid that should happen. How many people here suffer from hurry sickness? Anybody? Um, when I, many, many years ago, moved to Chicago and uh, was living in a ministry setting with young kids that was real fast-paced, uh, I called Dallas Willard, who was a real important mentor for me and for lots of other folks, and described the nature of our lives. And then I asked him, Dallas, what do I need to do to be spiritually healthy and alive and a good father and good husband and a good person. And there was a long pause with Dallas. There was always a long pause. And then he said this, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And then there was another long pause. And then I said, okay, what else do you have for me? Because I got that one and I don't have a whole lot of time and I want to get as much wisdom as I possibly can. <laughs> and he said, no, there is nothing else. He said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. He said, it is impossible to live fully present before God or fully present with another person in the reality of the kingdom in a hurry. He said, there's a big difference between being busy and being hurried. Being busy is mostly an outward condition of the body. It may be having a number of activities to do. We all have different capacities for busyness. Being hurried is a condition of the soul. It is when I am so consumed and preoccupied that I am unable to be fully present with my Heavenly Father or with whatever person that I am with. And in particular, Jesus says, now, if we're going to live in a life beyond worry, here and elsewhere, we must do it one day at a time. He says, each day brings trouble enough of its own. Tomorrow will bring its own troubles. If we look in the future, we get overwhelmed. 
I just found this not too long ago. U.S. Department of Agriculture said every year the average American will eat 1,996 pounds of food, about a ton per year. Now think if you went into a room that had all the food that you were to eat in a lifetime, 42,000 pounds of dairy, 14,000 pounds of beef and poultry, 7,000 pounds of butter and fat. If somebody sat me down in a warehouse and said I had to eat that much food, I would be overwhelmed, and yet we all do it. How do we do it? What is our secret to putting away 75 tons of food? We do it one day at a time. One day at a time. How in the world will you face all the heartbreak life will hold for you? How are you going to deal with all the problems? How will you handle all the disappointment? One day at a time. We all think the answer to anxiety is to have less bad stuff happen to us. And sometimes people think, if I become a Christian and follow Jesus, then God is supposed to make sure that I get protected from bad things. All my tests go great. I ace all my classes. I ask somebody out. They'll go out with me. And so Jesus does not say that. He does not say, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow everything is going to be okay. He says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day will have trouble enough of its own. His prediction is trouble today, trouble tomorrow. Turn to the person next to you real fast. Just say to him, trouble today trouble tomorrow. That's the prediction. We don't worry. We don't get freed from worry because we'll enter into a trouble-free life. We get freed from worry when we enter into existence under the care of a Heavenly Father who feeds birds and dresses flowers in a community of people, of quite remarkable young people and thinkers and scholars who can live together in care and fellowship and love. You live an eternal life, remembering in gratitude, engaging with love, dwelling in peace. God I pray right now for every young woman, every young man sitting here that you would deliver them from fear and worry and immerse them in your peace. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.